Good evening. Before we begin tonight's lesson, I just want to take a brief survey of something. Show of hands of those that are members of the Church of Christ who weren't raised in the church or around the church environment. You obey the gospel maybe later on in life. You say somebody taught you the gospel. You weren't raised in a, we sometimes say, Christian home. All right, just take a survey of those numbers. Now, hands down for those folks. What about the folks that were raised? You say, well, my parents are members of the church, grandma or aunt or somebody. What about those? All right, and so here it seems that the one outweighs the other, right? And so you just think about those numbers. Those of you who weren't raised in the church, as we sometimes say, raised in the church, what we mean is raised in a Christian home where parents or loved ones were members of the church. But I want you to think about those people that raised their hands the first time, those people who weren't raised affiliated with the church. Sometime at some place, somebody invited them. Somebody said, let's study the Bible, or they saw a video or something that said, hey, let's talk about eternal matters. Now, what about this? Last one. Show of hands of those who just on their own studied the Bible themselves and knew what they had to do to be saved and then just were looking for somebody to point them, hey, I just need somebody to immerse me. I've studied this on my own. No help. Nobody invited you. Nobody said anything. You just sort of dug in on your own. Maybe there is somebody like that tonight. Well, all right, then um, I just want you to see that evangelism doesn't happen by osmosis. Now, there are people that have done that. There have been people in prison and other places stories of individuals who read the New Testament and then have just gone from one religious institution after another saying, I want to find the people that teach what I've studied and what I've read in Scripture. I'm not saying that's an impossibility. I just want you to see that there are some who wouldn't hear the gospel unless we go out and do what the New Testament says that we should, and that is go out and evangelize. However, we're going to talk about evangelism tonight, but before we do that, I want to just address some of the, I guess you could call them hangups or excuses. How did I say this? Some of the struggles we face in evangelism. Number one, sometimes somebody says, I don't know what to do or what to say. I want to be evangelistic. I know this is important work. I know there are souls on the line, but I just really, I'm, I'm like Moses in Exodus 4. I don't have a mouth to speak. I'm not eloquent with words. I don't really know where to begin with individuals. And so maybe, that, maybe that's you. Or I'm not a people person. It's hard for me to strike up a conversation with a stranger. I just don't go out. I'm not one of those types of people that just go out if I see somebody at the doctor's office not a conversation starter, sort of introverted or whatever the case may be. That's not me. What about me? I know I need to evangelize, but that's not really something that comes natural to me. What, what should I do? Next, sometimes we're afraid of rejection and how we're going to be received. Well, what if I go out and talk to people and then they don't receive it? Or what if they even respond harshly to what I have to say to them about the gospel? And so because that's happened to me or I'm fearful about that happening, I've just sort of backed off. I don't really want to get into confrontation with somebody else, what about fear and evangelism? Sometimes that gets in our way. What if they ask me something I don't know? Anybody ever worry about that? You say, well, what if they have a question that I don't know the answer to? Well, let me just say this about this one. If that's going to hold us back from evangelism, we're just never going to evangelize, right? If you don't know everything, they may ask you the one thing you don't know, and so that's reason enough to just never do it at all. We can't use omniscience or perfect Bible knowledge as an excuse to say, oh, well, I just can't go out and talk to people about the Lord. Instead of that question, we should be saying, what do I know? What can I share? Where can I begin, at least with that? Next, I tried before and wasn't successful, so I haven't quit evangelism. I just sort of slowed down. At one point, I was very evangelistic, but I was told no so many times. So many Bible studies didn't end as I thought, so I'm still evangelistic. I'm just not as zealous in it as I used to be. Used to be more on fire, used to be more out front, but over time, I've just sort of backpedaled on this. I don't talk to people about the Lord as much as I used to. There are so many other things to do in the Christian life, right? You've got a family to raise. You've got to walk in the light yourself, help yourself, go to heaven, walk in the light, follow Jesus. Imagine if these were fishermen saying this. They went out to a lake to actually fish. And when they got there, they had to make sandwiches to eat, right? They've got to make sure the boat stays clean. They've got to do all these other things. And over time, just don't have time to fish anymore. I mean, the very thing they're supposed to do. Luke 19, 10, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And sometimes all the things that are involved in the Christian life, we may sort of push this down to the bottom. I heard Rob Whitaker say one time about evangelism, every work in the church should be evangelistically minded. That is, if it doesn't involve souls, even those things that edify and encourage us to help us remain saved, if it doesn't involve souls, if we can't tie it to souls, we ought to just scrap that work or find another way to do what we were doing before. And this is the last one, I believe. Well, we're growing already, and so there are enough people doing it. Evidently, there are great people at evangelism. I'm, we're baptizing people, and I'm involved in that. And um, let me say, you can be involved indirectly in evangelism for sure. You don't have to necessarily 
be the one to do the Bible study. So that's true. But don't leave it to other people. Don't be distant and say, well, you know, Paul didn't want to labor where other men did. He didn't want to boast in another man's labors. It was personal to Paul. It must be personal. To us. And so we need to remember that. And people placing membership is biblical and true and good. But most times those people are already members of the kingdom. And so you couldn't look at that and say, well, that's New Testament church growth per se. And so I need to take this personal. There's one more that's not on here, but it often comes up. And I thought about it when I was driving here. Oh, I should have put that one on there. Well, what about foreign missions? Everybody always says, well, we really need to be worried about what's over there in other countries. And we need to be serious about that. And we do. But people right around us need to hear the gospel as well. The souls in China or Africa or Puerto Rico, wherever we might go, aren't any more precious than the ones right here in Lakeland. And so we do need to go on foreign mission fields and where people have never heard the gospel. But keep in mind, we need to repeat the message again, as the song we just sung mentioned, to people that have already heard it and people that move in our communities. And as our country changes and it's dynamic, there are people that haven't heard it here. And so America itself is becoming a mission field. So let's not use the foreign mission thing to say, well, we can't do anything. So tonight, this is what I want to do, and then we'll extend heaven's invitation. I want to talk about what I believe are the four calls to evangelism. And these are going to be straight out of scripture. What does the Bible say about evangelism? These are going to be simple, straightforward, four calls of evangelism that we need to answer as Christians. And then I want to end this lesson very practically, very Monday to Friday, what can I do? But I don't want to come up with these on my own, so I looked in the New Testament and wanted to see what did the early church do? How did they actually do it? They answered the call to evangelism. What did they practically do that isn't beyond our ability to do? And then we'll extend heaven's invitation. So that's what we'll do tonight. Call number one, there is the call from above. This is from God. If this were the only call we could talk about tonight, this would be enough or should be enough to get us going. There's a call from above. It's just a simple thing that God has told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, and we just should do it. If there were no other calls that I was going to mention tonight, this one should be enough that God told us to do it. In 1 Kings 22 and verse 18, Micaiah the prophet said, whatever the Lord says to me, that will I speak. And we often use that verse to talk about preaching, and that's right, and that's true. But it applies to anything that God has told us to do. Whatever God says, that will I speak. I think about a story in Jeremiah 35. In Jeremiah 35, the prophet's making a point, or God's making a point through the prophet about a group called the Rechabites, these individuals that have received instructions from their forefathers not to drink wine and not to build homes to live in. And so God tells Jeremiah, hey, would you go and try to tell those folks to drink wine and see what will happen? And you know what happens? They say, we can't do it. Our forefathers said, we can't, we will not drink wine, can't do it. And then God sends the punchline through Jeremiah. These people obey their physical forefathers and do whatever he said that they should do, and they won't bend and they won't budge, and my people won't do what I told them to do, and I'm their God. You get the point. And so in every one of the Gospels, at the end of all four of the Gospels, Jesus ends those accounts as the inspired writers write it, saying, go out and preach to everybody. In Matthew's account, that's what Phil read for us. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Mark's account has the same thing. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe will be condemned. You go to Luke 24, Luke 24, 46. Thus it is written, it was necessary for Christ to suffer that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in my name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Luke says, go and preach the good news. Jesus says it through Luke's account. Start in Jerusalem and then John. Now, John's is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I grant you that, but I believe it's still there. Three times in John 21, verse 15, 16, and 17, Jesus tells Peter, I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to tend to the flock, and that would involve teaching them so that they could go out and teach others. There's a call from above. God looks down on his people, and he says, go out and evangelize. Will we answer the call of God to just simply do what God has commanded for us to do? How long could you stay on a job if every time there was a particular assignment in the job, the employer told you to do it and you just didn't do it? Or there was a bill to be paid, and every time that bill came, you just really didn't like to look at it. It just made your skin crawl that the light bill was creeping up at that amount around Christmas time. You hung the lights out, and you just slid that one under the stack. What about this one? I just hate April 15th, tax season, you know, I'll just sort of bump the IRS, no big deal. How many years could you do that without getting a cool set of new bracelets, right? How long could you do that? 
How long can we say, well, I know God's pleased with me. I know I'm in the light. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. The call from above is go out, go forth. I want you to go out and teach people. And you just say, well, now there are a lot of things I'm willing to do, God. Now there are a lot of things in Christianity I'm all about. Evangelism, it's not one for me. There is a call from above that says go. That's enough. Whatever fears or anxieties or hesitations or lack of knowledge we might possess, this should be enough to say, we've really got to get serious. I've got to get serious personally about saving souls because guess what? God told me to do it and I want to please him. This was not lost on the first century church, was it? In Acts 1 and verse 8, Jesus told him, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, all Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And when you read through the book of Acts, Jesus said, go into all the world. What did they do? What's the book of Acts all about? At least in part. They did what Jesus said. There was a call from above, and they did it. Even when in opposition, they were told to stop preaching. I want you to notice what they said. Go to Acts chapter 4. This is a little engraving heavenly truths review, so this is a two for one. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Luke, Acts 4, 19 and 20. Now, these verses, I want to show you two, one in Acts 4 and one in Acts 5, and it's around this idea of evangelism. And notice what the apostles say when they say you can't preach. Basically, you can't evangelize. You cannot answer the call from above. I'm in Acts 4, beginning in verse 19. We'll start in 18. They called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Don't fulfill the Great Commission. Verse 19, Peter and John answered them and said, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Peter's response is, God told us to do it. Are you crazy? We've got to do this. We have no other choice. We can't help but speak and say the things that we've heard. The second one's in Acts 5. In Acts chapter 5, same scenario, they straightly charged them in verse 28 not to preach in Jesus' name anymore. What does verse 29 say? We ought to obey God. Rather, than, That's about evangelism. We can quote that verse in a lot of different contexts, that if the government says we can't preach or teach this, we should. That's right. And if they say you can't teach this part of the New Testament truth on marriage or whatever, that's true. But in its context, that is about the subject we're talking about tonight. Stop evangelizing. And every time the apostles said, there's a higher call that we must answer. We've got no choice but to evangelize. We, there's a call from above. God is saying, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And the apostles and the early Christians wore this burden in a heavy way. And in a healthy way, they went out and covered the Roman Empire with the gospel. They knew it wasn't on them on how people responded. And we'll talk more about that. They weren't guilt-tripped into thinking, well, what if these people don't convert? They knew that wasn't their responsibility. But what was their responsibility? was to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, primarily for this reason. Simply put, God told him to do it. What part of the Christian life can I just ignore? God, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And if we don't obey him in this, will he be pleased with us? This isn't about whether or not you're good at evangelism. That's really what this is. Not, it's not, isn't about whether you're an extrovert. This isn't about whether you can get on a plane and go to Africa or do what Don Iverson does in India. It's really not about that. Are you going to obey Jesus? Am I going to obey Jesus? Because there's a call from above. Two more passages on this, and then we'll move to the second call. But there's tw two times in the book of Acts that I count that Jesus likewise tells Paul, you must preach this. You have to keep doing it. In Acts 18, when Paul's in Corinth, in verse 9 and verse 10, he says, you cannot cease to preach the message I'm telling you to preach. You've got to say something. I've, I've got much people in this city. Don't be silent is basically what he tells Paul. You have to say something. And then in Acts 23, verse 11, he says, you must testify about me in Rome just like you've done in Jerusalem. Paul, you've got to fulfill the Great Commission. He wasn't going to make Paul. Paul's free will had to cooperate with it. But there's a call from above. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? Is Jesus your Lord? Is he your master? Go into your world and preach the gospel. There is a call from above that says we should do this. Number two, there's a call from without. In Acts 16, Paul wanted to go two places, and both times the Holy Spirit told him, no, there was Asia, and then there was Bithynia, which is a region in northern Asia Minor. Paul wanted to go to those places. The Holy Spirit told him he couldn't go. But you remember Acts 16 and verse 9, there was a man from Macedonia who appeared to Paul in a dream, and he said, come over to Macedonia and do what? Help us. We sing a song about that. There's a call come ringing over the restless way. Do what? Send the light. Who's the light? 
You know we're singing that to ourselves. We are the very light we sing about God sending. There isn't some light coming from somewhere else. There's a call from without. Individuals that are outside of Jesus Christ saying to people like you and to people like me, come over and give us some help. We need help. We need somebody to teach us because we don't know. Jesus promised in Matthew 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled. That is, if somebody has this desire for the right thing, they'll be filled. And God definitely does a part in that, but I don't know if we realize how much we play a part in that. There are people that hunger and thirst for righteousness that are seeking God, and we are those clay pots, those jars that pour the water of life into other people as we point them down heaven's road. We're the light of the world, Matthew 5, 16. Send the light he has. That's us. Come over to Macedonia and help us. There's a call from without. How does this sound? How does the call, so we don't have a dream like Paul had in Acts 16, what does the call from without look like in 2019 in Lakeland? Maybe it looks like this. Somebody says, I'm really reading the Bible, and I don't understand what I'm reading. I know you go to church. Could you help me? That sound familiar? Acts 8, 30 and 31, Philip said to the eunuch, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I accept some man got me? Sometimes the call from without comes that way. Sometimes the call from without comes if somebody sees you. You know, I always see you post Bible verses, and I see you post sermons on your Facebook posts and all of that. I'm interested. What church do you go to? And I watched one of those Facebook lives one time, and I didn't hear any instruments. That's kind of strange to me. I've never heard that before. Why do you worship like that? It doesn't sound like this person saying, come over and help me. But they're asking for aid in one way or another. Hey, I saw you share something about a baptism. I was back. Why, why are people baptized? Why do people do that? Why do people go down in the water? What does that have to do with salvation? Must you be baptized? Somebody saying, come over and help me. My family and I are going through trials. It's a difficult time for us. I know you're a spiritual person. Would you keep me in your prayers? Come over and help. There are all of these different avenues and ways in which people are saying to you and saying to me, I know you know the way. I'm lost spiritually. Would you come over? There's a call from without. People are standing on the shores saying, would you guys come over and would you send some help? And we can't just pass by them. We have to invest in their lives and try to point them in the right way and answer the call that comes from without that says, we need your help. In Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas go into a synagogue and they get this opportunity. And when they go there, the men say, do you have any word of exhortation from the people? Then go ahead and say it. And they do. And in verse 42, the Bible says they beg Paul and Barnabas. They say, you can come back that next Sabbath. We know the Jews don't want it, but you can come back next week and we'll just hear that same sermon again. You teach us this same material again. We really want to learn what it is we need to do to be saved. And more Gentiles in that area obey the gospel than Jews because they were hungry and Paul and Barnabas answered the call that was coming from without. Maybe you think this call doesn't happen anymore. We believe that our world is becoming more secular. And maybe the way the news sort of spins things, we talk about fake news, maybe you would think that. Time Magazine, I guess this doesn't count. They're news too, right? So be consistent. But they did run an article that said in 20, by 2050, based on the numbers that they see, atheists and agnostics are shrinking to almost very, a very small percentage in our society. They, I guess, guesstimate that the population is going to grow about 3 billion people by 2050. And every major religious group is expected to grow as well, except for the Buddhists. The title of the article is, The World is Becoming More Religious. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's wanting New Testament Christianity. I know a lot of people today are saying we're spiritual and not religious. I understand that. But I do believe that in the spirit of the Athenians, in Acts 17 and verse 21, people are desiring to learn and hear something new. But we better get out and try to teach them the truth. For every call from without that we reject, if you say, well, I'm, I'm not going to teach this person. I don't know yet. They mentioned something once. I missed that opportunity. I kind of slept on this chance to do something. When we finally do answer the call, there will be so much religious error embedded in those individuals. We're going to have to double down on now trying to teach them the right way, the New Testament way on what they must do to be saved and walk in the light. And so how about we just do what Paul and Barnabas, I mean, Paul and Silas and Timothy did and answer the call from without. In verse 10 of Acts 16, a reason, hey, the Lord wants us to go and preach to these folks. It's like the Philippian jailer. They're in prison and he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Sometimes it just comes directly like that. And I need to be willing and ready to answer it. Number three, there is the call from within. 
This one's personal. Nobody can do this one for you. Nobody can do this one for me. There's the call from above. Jesus says, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Can we disobey that? There's the call from without where people say, hey, I really need help. Would you study the Bible with me? What does the Bible say about this subject or that subject? And that's on the outside. That's them. But then there's something inside of me that says, I really love people and I don't want them to be lost. And I've got a response to this call. It's the Isaiah response of Isaiah 6 and verse 8. Who will go for us? Who will we send? Here am I. Send me. Nobody could make Isaiah feel that. That's his heart. And he wants to go out and reach people. Do you have that? Is there something inside that says, I really love people and I want them. I've got people in my family, my circle of influence, my friends. Nobody has to guilt trip us into evangelism if we really love people. Now, we might need help about the technique and we can get material and we can talk about but no material, no technique, no seminar can help with this one. You've got to fix this one on your own. If we really don't love people, if we're not concerned about where people are heading, more on that in a moment, there's nothing that can be done for us until we change and adjust our hearts and the disposition we have. Throughout the book of Romans, Paul, Paul deals with this idea. I want you to go to the book of Romans. Go to Romans chapter 1, and let's walk through a few of these as Paul addresses this call from within, this desire on his part to go out and preach the gospel to people, and he wants to see him be saved. Go to Romans chapter 1, and notice first, Paul says he's under obligation. Romans 1, 14 through 16. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. That debtor in the old King James, that's I'm under obligation. I've got a duty to do this. I'm under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. As much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you in Rome also. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul says in verse 14, I'm a debtor. I'm under obligation. Verse 15, he's eager. He's ready. What is that? Paul wants to do it. There's God telling him as an apostle, right? 1 Corinthians 9, 16, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. There's the Macedonian call. Paul, Silas, come over and help us. But Paul's got something going on in his heart. And Paul wants to go out and teach other people. What about this one? Romans chapter 9. Turn to this one with me. Romans 9, 1 through 3. And this is in that section I mentioned this morning. Romans 9, 10, and 11. Study those three chapters together and see what Paul's saying about Jews and Gentiles and the Jews' role in salvation and what Jesus or God was doing through them. But notice his strong language in Romans 9, especially beginning in verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Now hold on with verse 1. Whatever Paul's about to say must be very serious because three times Paul's prefacing this with, I am not telling you a lie. What I'm about to say is the truth indeed. He says, I I say the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Paul says, what I'm about to tell you is going to be shocking, but it is the truth. In verse 2, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul, you don't mean that. You ever prayed that? Paul says, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying to you. My conscience bears witness with the Holy Spirit. I wish I was lost so that the Jews could figure it out and get it. Now, of course, Paul wants to be saved, but he really loves them enough. And I know it's shocking and people might try to get around. Paul didn't really mean, Paul says, I'm telling you the truth. This is how bad I want people to be saved. I was in their shoes. I was them. Paul says, and now that's what I want for them. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not, not according to knowledge. And they being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to them that believe. It's his heart's desire and prayer to God that Israel might be saved. You see him. Chapter 9 and in chapter 10, what does Paul mention? His heart, his mind. He's consumed with the fact that these people are lost. Paul just can't sit idly by and say, well, that's them. I'm in Christ. Too bad. I had the Damascus Road experience. Ananias taught me. Paul's invested in them. There's a call from within Paul that he just can't sit well with it. Paul been rejected. Paul have struggles and people get upset with him. Wasn't going to make him. The last one is Romans 10, 14 and 15. It's about preaching. But he says, how then will they call on him and who they have not believed? And how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they're sent? 
as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And then he goes on to say they haven't all obeyed the gospel, but faith comes by hearing. They've got to keep hearing this message. Paul has a burden on his heart. He wants these people to be saved. Do we have that? Do we have this desire in our hearts? Is there a call from within that says, you know, when I go places, I go to stores, I think about how many of these people are lost in here? When I go to the ball game, maybe I don't stand up, hijack the intercom, and make my plea for people to hear, believe, repent, confess, but it's on my mind that, you know, there are a great majority of people that are lost. It was in Paul's heart, and because of that, he wanted people to be saved, and we've got to have that same desire within us. There is the call from within to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. And Paul and the first century Christians, they got it. They had a desire. When they saw lost people, they realized, could be me. Could have been you. Brittany and I are not Christians today. If somebody at Taco Bell in 2009 didn't just simply say, well, you, would you like to come to worship with me? I don't know the first set of hands that went up and said, well, I wasn't raised in the church, whatever the case may be. I don't know how that worked out. Maybe, some, But there was somebody at some point that answered one of these calls and said, hey, can we study the Bible? Hey, I've got a track. I've got a video. Would you like to do that? And maybe they've been turned down 20, 30 times, and they thought, oh, this person's never gone. And here you are tonight. If we must do unto others as we would have them do unto us, Matthew 7, 12, we can't reject this. Within our hearts, there has to be something done so that we, like Jesus, care about the souls of men. One, one more thing before we move on to the last call. I want to introduce you to two guys. They actually live where Brittany and I live before we moved to the south side recently. Carlton Arms, North Lakeland. These two guys made the news recently because they were at the pool. And one of them name is Jacob Polis, and the one, his name is Justin Perez, the guy with the black shirt on. There was a kid drowning in the pool, and they saw the guy drowning in the pool, and the one grabbed him out, and then Justin pulled him out, and he said some time ago, he's 15 years old, he had a CPR class in seventh grade, and all he remembered was 30 chest compressions and two resuscitation breaths every so often, and he said, that's what I knew, and that's what I did. He was interviewed, they got these plaques and these awards, and the fire chief said about them in the newspaper, well, these guys saw a need. They reached out and saved a life. Is he ready for med school because he saved a kid that was drowning in the pool? You say no, but he knew a little something, and he used what he knew, and he saw the guy drowning, and he said, it just makes sense to help him. The fire chief said they saw a person in need. They saved a life. It just makes sense. Give them awards. You say, well, I don't know enough. You know, hear, believe, repent, confess and be baptized. I don't know everything. You know enough to do that. You see people ever about you drowning, and you see people that are in need. He learned this in the seventh grade. I don't know if he ever thought he would need to use it, but all of a sudden, there was a need in front of him. He jumped in, did the best he could, and now somebody doesn't have to bury their child because, hey, they stepped in and helped. Everybody we reach out to won't obey the gospel. I understand that, but we can't just sit idly by and wait till we're professionals before we can go out and reach people. Now, one more, and then the practical side of tonight's lesson. Number four, there is the call from below. In Luke 16, 19 through 31, there is the parable, or some people don't believe it's a parable. I think it is with the rich man and Lazarus, and this individual's in torment, and he's suffering. And you remember how this happens. The rich man lifts up his eyes in torment. Verse 24 says that he's suffering so bad that he says, would you send Lazarus to dip his finger to cool my tongue? And Abraham says, as Moses and the prophets listen to them, I want you to read with me, 27 down through 31. And then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they would repent. And he said to him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. This is about the hearts of individuals, and Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees, but appreciate that even while this man's in torment, what does he want? He's more evangelistic than some people that are on the other side. He says, Can you? I know my brothers are as selfish and as sinful as I am. Would you get people down there? I don't want them coming here. You've studied with people, I know I have, and one woman, she just stopped the Bible study, cold turkey. Things are going well. We got to a certain point. She said, if what you're saying is true, my family's lost. We're not studying anymore. She never came back, never studied with me again. You know people who've said, I just can't believe that. 
if you must be baptized to be saved, that there's only one church, I want nothing to do with that. You just sank my entire family to hell. I just couldn't believe that. I always turn to Luke 16. I'm not your judge. I'm not your family's judge. But I know this. If they really love you, if they're your family, and if they really are lost, and if they're really in torment, the last person they want to see there is you. There's a show that comes on. It used to come on. It's called Scared Straight. It's at-risk youth and teens that are in big trouble, and they say, look, we got to change these kids' lives. Let's get them to prison. And maybe if they see what prison is like, if they see the people that are behind bars reaching out to grab them and do hurtful, maybe it'll shock them. Maybe they'll be scared straight, and it'll fix them, change their lives, take them to a real prison, let them talk to lifers and people that are never come up. Maybe it'll shake them up. And sometimes on that show, Somebody will just be walking through one of the kids. They're in line. They're in the prison suits. They want them to get the real feel. And somebody will see somebody in their family. Sometimes it's their dad or sometimes it's their uncle or cousin. And they'll call out to the kid and say, what on earth are you doing here? Well, I'm in this program. I'm in trouble and I'm about to. And they always tell them. Now, maybe the other things work. Maybe they don't. But when it's family, they get eyeball to eyeball and they say, I don't want to see you. You better never come back to this place. You don't want to be in here with me. They're suffering. They're in prison. They're not saying, well, hey, like to have a crowd. Love to have you here. They say, oh, you better straighten up your act. It might be their dad. They've never seen him before. They see him, and it shakes them, and they say, the person in prison, I don't want this for you. People are really only going to one of two places when life's over. And according to Jesus in Matthew 7, 13, and 14, the great majority of people are going to hell. Enter in at the straight gate, because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many people go in there at. But as we see many people going in there at, help, we need to pull and not push. We need to say something to people that are on their way to destruction, people that are already there. We can't reverse their circumstances. If they die at loss, they're lost forever and a day. But we can hear their voices saying to us, would you save people from this deadly situation I'm in? Because when the Lord comes back, he's coming back in flame and fire to take vengeance on those that don't know God and those that don't obey the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. There's a call from heaven that says, oh, there's a call from without saying, I really want to know the truth. Help me. There's the call from within that says, I need to go. But surely there's a call from below saying, I'm tormented in this flame. And would you send people to help others not come where I am? And Abraham says what Jesus says to us, they're already out there. They've got the New Testament. They've got the words of the apostle. Listen to them. Will we listen to them? Four calls. We need to answer those. Now, before we extend the invitation, and this list is a little lengthy, I guess, but how do we answer the call? And I'm just going to show you what I believe the early church did and how they answered the call and how we can do this practically Nothing magical about this. I think we just need to put it into practice, and then we'll extend heaven's invitation. Number one, what about prayer? When the early church was told, don't preach, yes, they said, we've got to keep preaching. We can't help but preach it. That's Acts 4. But, and Vince preached on this a month or two ago, boldness, they prayed for great boldness. You say, I'm afraid of evangelism. Have you prayed for boldness, boldness in evangelism? You say, well, where I work or where I live, there aren't many people. Have you prayed for open doors? That's what Paul prayed for, Colossians 4, 2 and 3. You think Paul was just some evangelistic guru? Paul said, pray for me that I might speak bold as I should, Ephesians 6, 18 and 19. You think Paul ever got nervous? He told the Corinthians, I was with you in fear and in trembling. Was Paul afraid? Sometimes. And what did he do? He didn't say, I can't evangelize. He said, pray for me. I really want to get involved with what if we mention this more in our public prayers? I think sometimes, and this isn't a slight to anybody, I, I pray prayers from this pulpit and when people respond, but we need to be careful that our public prayers in the assembly aren't so shallow. What if we prayed about, I mean specifically, and said, we want to pray for souls, specific people. What if there was some way that we could figure out who's in a Bible study? Let's pray for those Bible studies. What if there was a spot in the bulletin for people that are having Bible studies with people, and we really got specific and said, we need to pray for that. We need to be praying about that. Or you say, well, I want opportunities. Would you put me on the prayer list? Pray for me that I can be bold about that. That's foreign to you. You say, well, that's far out there. Are we really serious? That's what they did. Look what they did. They prayed. They prayed for opportunities. for open. They were serious. Are you praying about it? Have you requested prayers about it for yourself, for others? That God would send you, send me to the people that really want to hear God. I don't want to waste time. 
2 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. That is a biblical prayer. Paul said, pray for us that we might be delivered from wicked and unreasonable men. All men don't have faith. Paul says, I want to go where people want to hear. Did you pray that? Do we pray that? Send me to the right people. The apostles prayed. Number two, they knew how to take a no and still go. They would go to a place and people would say, Acts 13, we don't want the gospel. Paul would say, seeing you judge yourselves worthy of eternal life and thrust for it from you, we're going to Gentiles, Acts 13, 46. They shook their clothes out in Acts 18 in Corinth when the people didn't want to hear. They could take a no on the chin and still go. Can you do that? You say, hey, would you like to come to worship? Nope, not interested. That stop you? Hey, would you study the Bible? I'm, I'm not into that religious stuff, that propaganda. I don't want anything to do with that. They knew how to take a no and just keep going. They just would go to the next town. They wouldn't try to force anybody. People would beat them and say, get out of here. Don't preach that here anymore. They say, hey, that's you. You don't want the gospel. We're not going to cast our pearls before swine. We can't make anybody. They would just keep on going to the next place. You say, well, I talked to one neighbor that used to live in that house, and they moved out, but they didn't want, they came one time, and then they didn't do anything. Okay, well, that's fine. Take a no and keep going. Well, I invited one coworker one time, and he said it was coming, and he never came, and so can we take a no and just keep trucking along and doing what the Lord says? Because that's what they did. Next, more attempts led to more results. Now, we talked about this in the Bible class this morning. It's just common sense. The more people you ask to study the Bible, the more Bible studies you'll have. The more people you invite to worship, the more visitors you'll bring. The more seeds you sow, the better harvest you'll reap. You say, I haven't had any Bible studies this year. How many people have you asked to study the Bible? None. That's not rocket science. That's just common sense. You don't deserve a Bible study. You didn't ask anybody. You don't want one. We need to be thinking about more attempts led to more results for them. Next, door knocking and hospitality. I know people say, well, this isn't the fifth. These people don't knock doors anymore. Door knocking is a way that we can go to people that won't come to us. Daily in the temple and from house to house, they went out and talked to people. Door knocking isn't the only way. I know some people hear evangelism, and that's all they think about, but some people are so opposed to door knocking. What do we have in place of it? Do we have a way to go to people who won't come to us? Jesus didn't say, go into all the world, build a building, and invite people to come into it. He said, you go out and confront them. Lost people don't generally ask for direction spiritually. You've got to go to them. And then this house-to-house business, they were hospitable. Do you have sinners in your home inviting people in to eat meals? You find out what matters most to people around the dinner table. Just invite them over. Just make friends with people that you know. Invite them over for dinner. In your mind, you know this is going toward a Bible study. I want to talk to them about heavenly things. But first, let's get to know them. Let's build a friendship. Maybe you say, well, my house, circumstances, I can't do that. You can have lunch with them. You just eat lunch with them every week, once a week, and you start building this relationship. You just have got to be intentional. We've got to be intentional. And that's what they did. Next, talk to religious people. Where did they go and preach? You can talk on this one. Where was their favorite place to go and preach? Synagogue. Why would they go to the synagogue? Aren't those people already religious? Aren't those people sort of offhand? They've already got a church. We should leave those people alone. They're religious. It's probably going to be somewhat easier. We think it may be harder. Paul thought, well, this is less ground to cover. I'm going to the synagogue where these people are ready. I realize they're Jewish or at least proselytes. Let's go to religious people. He opened and alleged that Jesus was Christ, Acts 17, 2 and 3. You know religious people. This is what we should say to our religious friends. Why do you go to the church you go to? And what do y'all teach about salvation? Hey, what did you hear in the sermon this Sunday? You're not being offensive. You're just asking them, hey, what did you hear this Sunday? Oh, he preached about this. You go study the passage and you come back and say, hey, now I've got a question about this. Hey, you know what I heard where I went to worship? And at the end, he extended the plan of salvation. Have you ever heard of this before? Did you do that to become a Christian? Don't run from religious people. Run to them. Run to the Baptists, the Presbyterian, the Methodists. That's what they did. They went to people who were already religious, the people we often retreat from. We want to find someone who doesn't go to church anywhere. Paul would say those people are right for it. I don't think we ought to hijack people's worship services and say, well, Paul did it in the synagogues. No, that's not what happened. But talk to religious people. Friends and family members, you know Thanksgiving's coming up. Christmas is coming up. You say, I really want my family, but I don't want to ruin the Thanksgiving meal. The Cowboys are probably going to lose anyway, so just go ahead and evangelize, right? What if you have some questions ready and you talk to religious people and your family? You say, I've tried that before. It just, just try. That's what the apostles did. Next, be nice and shine light. We're written epistles, known and read of all men. 
Be the nicest person on the job. Be the nicest neighbor in the neighborhood. Not just in silence, but actually in activity. Get people Christmas cards that are your neighbors. Be kind to them. Learn their names. Learn their birthdays. Learn their kids. Be a nice person. You've got to have your eyes open, eyes up. You want opportunities? God's going to give them to you. If you pray, have your eyes open. If you're alert, if you're ready, be a nice person. Shine the light because people need it. Look out for prospects and be ready. Question, who are you praying about right now for evangelism? Who's on your radar? Maybe somebody's come up through this lesson. If I've got nobody on my radar, that doesn't make me a bad person, bad Christian. Let's get somebody on the radar. Let's start thinking about people. Let's ever keep the list going. And even after you say, well, I've reached out to Tom. Tom's not interested. Well, that brought my list down. I need to get somebody else on there. Be praying about them specifically. Be talking to this individual personally. Keep prospects ever on your mind, ever before you. Not, I want to evangelize somebody out there far, far away. Who do I really know? Let's put names and faces on people. Be ready. And then are we ready? What do you have? Do you have a track? Do you have a church card? Are you ready? with an invitation, with material, or whatever, just the Bible. If you say, well, I'm good with just the scriptures, be ready. Because when God throws the opportunity, what a shame it would be to say, oh, they said something about church, and I thought I had that gospel meeting flyer, but I left it. Be ready. Keep something in the car or in the wallet or in the purse or in the bag or something so that we don't miss opportunities. I believe this is the last one tonight. They knew the plan of salvation. This is what I mean by they knew the plan of salvation. And this point was longer, but I shortened it for the slide. They knew, the first century Christians knew the plan of salvation so well that it really didn't matter where people were on the road to salvation. They could meet people anywhere. That's why you won't find a cookie cutter method in the book of Acts. There is no one step formula of, you know, well, I don't see here, believe, repent, confess all in one shot in the book of Acts. You won't find it because they knew the scriptures and the plan of salvation so well that if a man was already reading and believing, they would cement that belief and just go on to, well, brother, you need to repent and confess and be immersed. If somebody had never heard anything, Acts 16, the Philippian jailer, they would start in verse 31 and say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Or on Pentecost, they would say, well, these folks believe he's the Messiah now that they're cut to the heart. They need to repent and be immersed. They were so acquainted with the plan of salvation that it really didn't matter where people were on the religious spectrum. They could meet them there. Now, listen. You and I don't have to be Bible scholars to do that. We just need to know the Bible plan of salvation. You say, I don't know that. Well, somebody, I, I don't know what I need to do to be saved. That needs to jump in my mind to priority number one in your Bible study. You say, well, I don't know the plan of salvation, but I'm just going to take a nice cursory reading through Ruth. No, you need to start with, in my opinion, let's get what people need to do to go from earth to heaven. I need to figure this out. I need to get an approach on how I can reach people with the gospel, this needs to jump up in my biblical priority list so that I can get involved. I don't double dutch. Maybe you have before. You've seen that before, right? Somebody's jumping rope, two people here, and there's somebody ready to jump in, but they just, at some point, you've just got to jump in and get involved. You can't just stand there ever waiting for perfect timing. There's no such thing. Be ready, in season and out of season. Always ready to preach to people the word and teach people the gospel. Those are the four calls of evangelism. And I believe that's how the first century church answered. That's what they did. They prayed. They were nice. They evangelized. They had their homes open. And Paul was able to say in Colossians 1.23, every creature under heaven had heard the word of God. You can't reach everybody. I can't reach everybody. But there are people that you can reach. There are people that I can reach, that we must reach. Maybe tonight you've never obeyed the gospel plan of salvation. I want to be very clear about what the New Testament teaches that people need to do in order to be saved. And I want to also emphasize that if you've never done this, Based on what Scripture teaches, you're not in a saved relationship. The Bible teaches we must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Do you believe that? John 8, 24, Jesus says, Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll die in your sins, and where I am you cannot come. The Bible teaches we must repent of our sins. Acts 17 and verse 30, God commands all men everywhere to repent. That's a change of mind that leads to a change of action. I believe Jesus is Christ, and because of that, I want to repent of sins. If you've done that, you need to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9, and 10. I need to confess that, but I still haven't found my way into Christ to be saved. After I confess him, I need to be immersed in water, baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
for the forgiveness of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 22, 16, Paul was told, why do you wait? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And then you rise from those waters. God adds you to his church, and you need to live your life faithfully until you die, Colossians 1, 23. That's what the Bible says. And we want to answer heaven's call and extend that invitation to anybody who needs to do so tonight. Let's pray about evangelism. Let's be serious about the souls of men. Maybe we can help you tonight. You need to be restored. Maybe you need prayers for courage with evangelism. Or you've been trying and you think you think about somebody and tonight we can pray for them. Maybe you can just take care of it in your seat. But let's be an evangelistic congregation. Let's answer the call from heaven, the call from without, the call from within, and the dreaded call from below. Vince is going to sing the song to encourage us. If you need to respond tonight, come as together we stand and sing.